Welcome everyone to the panel on global environmental justice, uh, global environmental governance, excuse me, which is part of the 27th annual conference of the International Environment Forum. The IEF warmly thanks the conference co-sponsors for their support, the Wilmette Institute, the Baha'i International Community, and EBBF, Ethical Business Building the Future. The format today will comprise presentations by our three distinguished panelists, whom I shall soon introduce, each presentation lasting about 15 minutes or a little more if time is needed, followed by a question and answer session of about 30 minutes, when panelists will respond to as many of your questions as possible in the time remaining. Be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box. However, if you have comments, those should go in the chat box. Okay, remember, questions in the Q&A box, comments in the chat box. Before introducing the panelists, a few words of introduction of the topic might be helpful. The current state of environmental governance has been summed up by the IEF as follows. Despite more than a half a century of international conferences, conventions, action plans, and other efforts to prevent the destruction of the planetary environment, its decline is accelerating <clears throat> with climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and waste becoming existential threats to our future and raising issues of social justice and eco-anxiety. Voluntary agreements, depending on the goodwill of countries have not worked to prevent the global commons, to protect the global commons from the impending threat of an eco-catastrophe. Our panelists will address different dimensions of the case for global environmental governance, beginning with a look at the latest IPCC assessment of policy successes and failures, and of the need for critical discourse on some enduring risk factors that the world's most vulnerable are facing with regard to the impacts of climate change. From there, we shall be learning about some fresh perspectives on governance that can be applied in practice by various stakeholders to the various global poly crises, as they've been referred to, that present day governments systems struggle to cope with. Finally, we will hear about the most recent progress that has been made largely through the work of the IEF. The report proposing a global environment agency to regulate on all global environmental challenges while protecting the global common good has recently been recognized by the UN High Level Advisory Board. Our first panelist will be Tahira uh, Mathi. Tahira Mathi, as the Interfaith Liaison Officer for the Baha'i Office of Public Affairs in South Africa, is responsible for raising environmental concerns provincially and nationally. She is past chairperson and an active member of the Southern African Faith Communities Environmental Institute. An experienced educator, Tahira is currently writing her PhD dissertation in peace building at the Durban University of Technology's International Center on Nonviolence. Tahira's presentation is titled Ethical and Environmental Justice Considerations Underpinned by Global Environmental Governance within the context of gendered vulnerabilities to eliminate change. Over to you, Tyra. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, greetings from a very beautiful Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, before starting, I really want to personally thank the IEF for this opportunity to speak on this very important topic. Um, I would uh, like to point out that most of the presentation would really be dealing with um, ethical considerations that are largely underpinned by inequality, which as a person in the South, I see very much unfold before my eyes each day as I as I travel in our community. So this is also my context um, of this um, presentation. I also um, 
I also want to perhaps at the beginning of this presentation, um, frame ethics within our spiritual identity. And for this purpose, I find um, within the Baha'i writings, the hidden words of Baha'u'llah uh, appropriate for us to ponder upon. And it says, O children of men, know we not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how he were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Such is my counsel to you, O concourse of light. Heed ye this counsel, that ye may obtain the fruit of holiness in the tree of wondrous glory. I think it's very important for us to, 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 to hold on to um, this fundamental element of who we are and to ground ethics in this understanding of our, our common oneness. So I thought I'd just start with a very simple definition of ch climate change. Um, according to the, um, this definition, it says, climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. Such shifts can be natural due to changes in the sun's activity or large volcanic eruptions. But since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas. Um, I point to this uh, definition um, because it points to climate change being human-induced. So it's, if something is caused by us, it also means we can become a part of the solution. So some of the main reasons for climate uh, uh, change or the reasons associated with it is kind of in five categories. We see unique and threatened systems, these extreme weather events, distribution of impacts, global aggregate impacts, and large scale singular impacts. And I must say now this week for the first time in Cape Town, a headline made head, uh, had made news because waves that come, ocean waves that come right over uh, the Cork Bay Harbor and an entire restaurant was destroyed. And now it's becoming a, a talking topic um, in our city. But the impact of that also means that a number of black women associated with work in that restaurant wouldn't be working for a considerable period of time. So immediately this is an impact that um, is real to many of the people in my city right now. So what, we, what we're gearing towards in this presentation is the gender dimension of climate change. So gender serves as an important di dimension of both vulnerability and adaptation. That is whether and how women, men, boys and girls are affected by and respond to climate change. And vulnerability is commonly understood as the social, economic, political, cultural and other factors which make specific groups more susceptible to adverse change. And right now this week, we've seen just a bit of that um, in my own town. Adaptation is the ability to change in response to the impacts of an event in order to minimize adverse consequences. But there are many factors that affect adaptation as well. Just by sheer design in society, by sheer power relationships, all of this impact on the ability um, for adaptation. We also see from the literature that both genders have vulnerabilities to the impacts of climate change that should be addressed in policies and practices that do not further assist in uh, um, 
further the existing um, gender equalities. And something that comes to mind um, is when there's a catastrophic event um, as a result of, of climate change, we might find that women need the permission in a cultural setting, need the permission of, of significant men in society as to whether they may or do something. And that of course has, has um, a number of implications for women and the girl child. So differences in experiences related to climate change are not limited to distinctions between women and men or boys and girls. Um, there are also dimensions that are influenced by other social categories such as age, class, race, ability, amongst others. And so these are also then related to the gender um, components that people experience um, with climate change. The consequences therefore are not evenly experienced and individuals are disproportionately affected. More so, we may find the lack of resources also adding to the experience of climate change, especially again for women and the girl child. So with detrimental effects of climate change, we are talking uh, in, in the context of natural hazards, landslides, floods, hurricanes, but we also have the long-term effects. So for women and the girl child, there will be the long-term effects that come with the degradation um, of the land, agriculture, the loss of biodiversity, um, women and girls being associated with water resources and so on. So I'm really foregrounding in this presentation um, how more so than others, women and the girl child are impacted by climate change. From the literature, we see that women are more vulnerable to the effects of, of climate change than men, um, primarily as they constitute the majority of the world's poor and are more dependent for their livelihood on natural resources. And obviously within a climate change setting, these resources are threatened more so in such times. So it's important to identify gender sensitive strategy, strategies to respond to the environmental and humanitarian crisis arising from climate change. We see across the world that women depend more on and yet have less access to natural resources. In many regions of the world, um, we see that they are the ones responsible for securing food, water, and fuel. And agriculture is the most important employment sector for women. And this is a, a sector that will obviously be very much influenced by drought and erratic, erratic rainfall. And again, uh, this will impact on, on the girl child um, who will leave school to help the mother in certain settings. So, when we, we consider um, what is happening in the climate change space, we glean from the literature and the experiences, especially when we're looking at the land and women's association with the land, we see male dominated land tenure structures throughout much of the world have made it hard for women to own land Women generally lack this ability to own the land. We have examples um, in sub-Saharan Africa. We have examples in Mexico, for example. We, we have the migration of men to the United States. Um, and this has, uh, in some instances, uh, resulted in women transferring the ownership of the land to themselves from their husbands in order to to protect the land from ex 
self-creation. But yet we see the comeback uh, scenario for women in such instances. And we see that in, in the case of Mexico, um, these transfers cause intra-household conflict in cases where the husband then return um, from the United States uh, back to Mexico. So um, we find that the women aren't just dealing with the physical impact of the climate change. There are also the relational components and the dynamics that women have to deal with when they are even trying to respond to the situation that they find themselves in. So what about then with this very brief, uh, we don't have much time as speakers, but um, when, we, when we look at um, the literature, we see the concerns are based in inequality, the, in, the unequal relationship, the power relationship between men and women, the health impacts, the mental health, um, su uh, suicide and depression that sometimes results from uh, the impacts of climate change. Women are very vulnerable. They can be trafficked uh, uh, during and post um, um, climate change events. They suffer unemployment. Um, the, the girl children especially have the loss of, of educational opportunities. And we see also from the literature that one of the big problems is the disempowerment of women in the decision-making processes and structures in the world. And even, ironically, even in climate change structures at the global level, when we look at the representation of women in such structures, it, it is much lower um, than 30%. And this is obviously uh, not helpful when we are trying to resolve uh, the issues around climate change and we are trying to uh, create uh, a better uh, situation in the world when it comes to dealing with the impact um, of, of climate change. Um, even in the literature, when we look at the literature and we look at what is being studied or what research is being done on the topic, we find that the gendered component of climate change is very much underrepresented and under-researched. Um, so we see, although some policy approaches aim at strengthening local communities, there's a lot of research around this, adaptive capacity, um, Significant aspects such as unpacking the relations of power, the inclusion in decision-making, and the need to change cultural habits that have denied the rights and opportunities of the marginalized and the poor, are, these are missing from this critical discourse on, on, on climate change. So in terms of the inequality, the research to date indicates that um, vulnerabilities to impacts of climate change are gendered. And the time may be opportune to consider the needs of humanity and the planet within the framework of global environmental government, go governance with effective measures taking into account all the aspects of climate change and sustainable development. Um, and I want to come back again to representation because I believe this is an important part of what we need to address. Although there is a push for increased female representation in environmental governance institutions, as well as for uh, gendered language in national and international climate policies, a lot more still has to be done um, in that component. Um, I want us to move on to uh, an important part of actions. Um, we need to, at an individual level, obviously, take in what the inequality is, is contributing to in this discourse. We also need to, as families, consult and respond to how we adopt a greener lifestyle. Um, we also need to, in our communities, 
consider lobbying. But I do believe at an institutional level, because this panel is really looking at um, global environmental governance. And if we consider the literature um, on the gendered nature of climate change, um, uh, Dr. Dahl and others might be onto a very good thing. And this could very well be the time for us to ask the question, is this the time to consider global um, environmental governance? Um, uh, surely the ethics uh, in this uh, discourse should be the ethics in which all people in the discourse benefit from the social action, benefit from the policies, benefit from whatever uh, remedial action um, we take. And so it can't be right, it, it can never be right, that one half of the world's population is, is left out of the decision-making um, spaces, that um, one half of the world's population isn't regarded as a or treated as an equal partner. So um, I want to thank uh, uh, everyone for their time and um, leave the presentation um, at that level and rely on um, my my very esteemed uh, uh, co-panelists to, to build upon um, the concern around the inequalities that exist in a gendered nature on this all important topic of climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tahira, for a brilliant talk. Our next panelist is Dr. Joachim Monkelbaum. Dr. Monkelbaum, he teaches at several universities, including the University of Geneva, and the China University for Political Science and Law. Your him is interested in how global megatrends interact to impact our daily lives. His the title of his talk is Megatrends, Global Risks, and the Call for New Understandings of Governance. Over to you, Dr. Malkabak. Uh, many thanks, uh, Fred, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with all of you today. Uh, and a special thanks, of course, uh, to, to all the, the hosts and organizers uh, of the event today. So indeed, um, the topic of my presentation, it's actually, uh, yes, it's about megatrends and governance, but uh, it will be more specifically about scenarios and strategies for uh, carbon competitiveness. Um, so it it's largely about uh, two of of the megatrends. You mentioned the word uh, megatrends, uh, Fred, and uh, two megatrends that typically needs to be uh, governed at the global level. I think are trade and uh, climate change. So uh, trade and climate change are typically uh, global phenomena, international phenomena. Um, but there's also interlinkages between trade and climate change. So I don't want to turn it into a lecture, but just to point out three linkages between uh, trade and climate change is that first of all, there's something called the scale effect. So if there's more trade uh, between uh, countries, then usually that leads to more economic activity, leads to more economic growth and leads to uh, bigger impacts uh, on the environment. For example, leads to more greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, second effect is composition effect. So because of trade, um, economies, they can change the composition of their economy. For example, Switzerland um, is one of the cleanest economies in the world. And that's because Switzerland is importing a lot of um, 
products uh, that are produced by um, by heavy industry. So a lot of heavy industry has moved from Switzerland to developing countries. Now Switzerland can import those products from developing countries. So domestically, uh, Switzerland has less pollution. But if you look at the consumption pattern, uh, the pollution might have actually increased in Switzerland over the past few decades. That's just one example. Um, so composition of economies can change. And then there's also something called the technique effect. So because of trade, for example, economies have access to more polluting uh, technologies. Um, some countries might suddenly get access to coal-fired power plants, and that's bad for, for the environment, of course. On the other hand, positive effect can be that through trade, uh, we can have access to clean energy. Uh, so uh, most of the solar panels, 90 or 95 percent of solar cells in the world are produced in China. Uh, and because China has started to produce solar cells at a very big scale, that's why we can uh, have access to solar panels at quite an affordable price now. The, the price of solar panels, I think, has decreased by 95 percent or so in the past 15, 20 years. So that there can also be positive effects uh, from trade. And then um, what we see as a bigger trend is that uh, countries try to increase their competitiveness, their economic competitiveness, by uh, focusing on climate action. Until uh, recently, um, it was not a competitive edge if you would focus on climate uh, action, because as I mentioned, uh, solar panel, uh, so solar energy used to be much more expensive. Um, so if you had more renewable energy in your energy mix, that meant that probably your production was more expensive, uh, your economic production was more expensive, and that made you less competitive. However, we're moving to a world where uh, we see that uh, there are carbon constraints are being put on what uh, countries can export. So we see, for example, uh, the EU has put uh, the carbon border adjustment measure into place, which means that um, if you want to uh, import products, for example, from the US, or from China into Europe, uh, then you have to pay for the carbon emissions that are emitted um, in the US and in China. And this is for a range of products from steel, aluminium, fertilizer. And um, so it's not just that you have to pay for the emissions uh, that are linked to production within the EU, but to level the playing field, the EU has said also, if you import products from outside the EU, you have to pay this uh, carbon price. Uh, France has now said that um, they want to limit uh, the, the number of cars from outside of the EU that will get a subsidy because if you buy an electric car in France, which we did uh, last year, you get a subsidy. And uh, now that France sees that China and other Asian countries become much more competitive in uh, producing electric cars, they have said, we will also look at the way in which those electric cars were produced. So if you produce electric cars in China, for example, by using a lot of coal power, then you cannot really say that this car is good for climate change, for example. This is what the French government is saying. So you see that there's more and more limitations are being put on what you can export, especially to the EU. And this is why um, this concept of carbon competitiveness is, is becoming more and more important. So what we have done at the World Economic Forum is that we have looked along two axes that you see here in this uh, figure. So uh, on the horizontal axis, you see on the left side cl climate failure, and on the right side, you see climate ambition. And on the vertical axis, you, you see on top collaboration versus at the bottom, you see conflict. Then if you uh, combine uh, those different um, axes, then you see on the right top that if we have uh, climate ambition, so we do a lot against climate change, and we have collaboration, especially over, uh, let's say, trade, over investment, then we can get climate back on track and we can make it to limiting climate change to, to global warming 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, the opposite scenario is that we would have conflict over trade and uh, we fail to do something about climate change. And then at the left, left bottom, you see that we will have exponential disasters. But there's also combinations uh, possible. 
between uh, those different scenarios. So at the right bottom, you see fractured uh, effort, which means that we will take climate action, but we will put limitations on um, collaboration, on trade and investment. And actually we might have trade conflicts. So uh, that means that there's a fracturing of, of trade and, and um, investment policies. Um, on the, on the left top, you can see collective avoidance, which means that we collaborate over investment, collaborate over trade, uh, but we fail to do enough about uh, climate change. So this is broadly the different scenarios that we have been looking at uh, and for governments, but also for individual companies and other organizations, it's important to see uh, to which uh, scenario their actions will uh, contribute, right? <clears throat> So more specifically, if we look at uh, exponential disasters, at the left, left bottom here, we see that if this happens, we will fail to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Um, there will be some climate and trade measures, but they're, they're misaligned uh, and there will be volatility in financial markets, um, which are so important for both adapting to climate change, but also for uh, financing climate action because we hear a lot about investment in climate action, but actually um, our investment uh, should be 10 times bigger than it currently is. Then if we have climate on track, that would, would mean, for example, that we would have a global trade climate governance process um, that will reduce trade conflict. Uh, for example, this could be led by the World Trade Organization or by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And um, this is to broadly set out some examples of, of what those different scenarios would look like. So um, we know uh, that um, Abdul Baha, for example, he spoke uh, quite clearly about the balance between competition and uh, conflict. Uh, sorry, competition and cooperation in economies. So we need a certain level of uh, cooperation, of course, which is very important. Uh, also, if you look from evolutionary uh, perspective for human species, uh, but there's also a need for competition because otherwise you get monopolies that will be rent seeking and that will abuse their, their position as a monopolist. So also at the bigger scale, I think we need a, the, the right balance between uh, collaboration on uh, trade and climate change uh, versus competition um, for reaching the highest uh, standards in, uh, in, in climate action, right? Um, and positively, I think we can see that actually uh, being carbon competitive and taking action on climate change is becoming a bigger and bigger factor um, in, in the decision-making of companies of where to settle. So companies are really looking at where they can uh, be based in order to use renewable energy, for example. And if we look at what are currently the companies that add a lot to uh, economic growth and to innovation, those are technology companies. And companies like Google, uh, like Microsoft, they're often the biggest purchasers of, of clean energy. So technology companies in particular, they are looking for those places where um, renewable energy is readily available they are not really interested in fossil fuel uh, energy systems. Um, so uh, this is not just because of climate change, but also because of reasons of uh, geopolitics and, um, um, and energy security. So my questions here uh, also to use to kind of stir the, the discussion is first of all, uh, what types of trade interventions are needed, what type of interventions in general, to move from the kind of bad side of the diagram that I showed, where we have a uh, collective failure, uh, and move to, to the side where we have success in terms of economic collaboration, but also in terms of uh, climate action, because they, they should really go together. Uh, secondly, uh, the question is, what role can our Baha'i values play in this process and also in the current geopolitical time frame, uh, where we see so much more of an emphasis on um, competition 
and not on uh, collaboration. That um, desire for collaboration, you can really see it waning in organizations like the, the World Trade Organization, where there was a huge uh, optimism, I would say, after 1990, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and the Iron Curtain. Uh, and, and where there was a big energy for globalization and for international cooperation versus the current time frame, where the, the, the current hegemon is uh, trying to keep the upcoming uh, global powers uh, below it, let's say. Uh, and the third question for the discussion would be that beyond our lofty ideals, what is the role of you and of your organization in influencing the drivers and the points of inf intervention for change, especially in um, global environmental governance, the topic of this discussion. So I will leave it at that for now, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to your uh, question. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll get some very interesting responses to your, to your questions. Thank you for those questions as well. Our next speaker, <clears throat> is Dr. Arthur Lyon Dahl. Arthur Dahl is president of the International Environment Forum on the advisory board of the Global Governance Forum and in the steering committee for the Climate Governance Commission. He retired as an assistant executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP and coordinator of the Global Earthwatch Program. Recently, Arthur co-authored proposals for a global environmental agency. The subject of his talk today is Global Environmental Governance Toward a Global Environment Agency. Over to you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here to join in this, this conversation. Let me start sharing my screen. So uh, we've already seen some of the challenges in addressing this issue, both in the terms of the gender imbalance and the victims of climate change, and then also in terms of how climate change is intimately linked with other issues like trade. So I would like to take you to looking at sort of where we stand with respect to global environmental governance and how we can sort of take this whole agenda forward and what we're already trying to contribute to that process as, as we go forward. We are, as always heard, we know that we're facing this environmental crisis or series of crises. The biodiversity is, biosphere represents a complex planetary system with great diversity integrated at multiple levels, but uh, we now have a series of combined environmental crises and the latest science is defining the risks and calling for urgently for better planetary governments to deal with these risks that only can be dealt with at the planetary level. While the biosphere has considerable resilience as it has over millions of years, the human impacts ranging from climate change and the erosion of terrestrial and marine bio ecosystems to widespread pollution are beyond planetary boundaries and pushing many environmental components to tipping points beyond which recovery may be impossible. And uh, just this last month, the latest version of the planetary boundaries framework has been released, showing us that we've now uh, overshot six of the nine planetary boundaries. Uh, not entities are, are chemical pollutants, climate change, biodiversity, land system change, freshwater is a newly added one, uh, biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus. We're very close in ocean acidification. We're doing a little bit better on atmospheric aerosols, and we actually have improved stratification ozone depletion. But by and large, we're far beyond what the planet can support, the safe operating space. So we really have to urgently do something to try to bring ourselves back away from these environmental crises. And of course, we need a systems perspective in order to do this. And this, of course, means that we, and this is quoting from the beautiful Baha'i community statement of one planet, one habitation, intimately embedded in this greater system and directly relied upon it. Humanity faces a paradox growing more consequential by the day. 
on the one hand, the human race has never held more power to shape the physical world on planetary scales. A development some have turned the Anthropocene. In fact, they're just recently fixed to the starting point for the Anthropocene in 1950. On the other, that very power, when untempered by thoughtful consideration, directed by priorities heedless of the present and the, the future common good, gives rise to consequences not only worldwide in scope, potentially irreversible. Our activities must reflect the fact that wealth and the wonders of the earth are the common heritage of people who deserve just and equitable access to these resources. So our choices must evince an intergenerational perspective in which the future, the well-being of future inhabitants is taken into account at all levels of decision-making. So this is really the, the Baha'i perspective of taking this much larger than many of the discussions today about looking at you know, the future inhabitants of the planet and looking at the long term. And Secretary General Guterres, when he was briefing the General Assembly priorities for 2023, warns about the confluence of challenges unlike any in our lifetimes. Wars grind on, the climate crisis burns on, extreme wealth and poverty rage on, the gulf between haves and have-nots is cleaving societies, countries, and our wider world. Epic geopolitical divisions are undermining global solidarity and trust this path is a dead end. It is deeply irresponsible and immoral. I think Secretary General Guterres uses some very strong language, which is fully justified by the challenges that we're facing you know, at the moment. And among the crises he cites in particular is our right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. He said, we must end the merciless, relentless, senseless war on nature. We're hurtling towards a deadly 2.8 degrees of climate change, an irreversible loss of biodiversity, an ocean choked with pollution, vampiric overconsumption of water draining the lifeblood of the planet. Isn't that beautiful language? <laughs> Requiring disruption to end the destruction. We need justice to replace the bottomless greed of the fossil fuel industry. Fossil fuel producers should not be in business when their product is, the corporate is our core problem. And countries should stop subsidizing fossil fuels. And that subsidy is in the trillions of dollars today. It's an enormous amount of money governments spend to subsidize fossil fuels. So climate action is the 21st century greatest opportunity to forward all the sustainable development goals. So this is really, you know, how we summarize our governance problem today. It's based on national sovereignty. Each na sovereign nation within their own borders can do what they want. The result, of course, is international anarchy. There's no real rule of law at the global level. We see the powerful countries struggling for power and world domination. There's even a pushback against multilateralism as countries want to keep out the, the migrants or whatever. We have multinational corporations out of control. And because we have a politics today that's based on self-interest, fragmentation, and you know, division rather than unity and concord. The failures of governments that we see today are behind many of today's problems from the local to the global level. In a world filled with ego, corruption, and aggression, with the rise of reckless political leaders and autocrats. And particularly, we have an enormous vacuum in the governance of corporations. Uh, we have, because they escape from any control from national governments at the multinational level. So we need a global legal framework for business in the corporate sector. We see environmental deterioration driven largely by their narrow search for profits by the corporate sector. And non-state economic actors as corporations should include in their legal charters an obligation to perform some useful service for society with social and environmental responsibility and not just to make profits. This would empower them to be effective partners in the search to the system-wide challenges facing the world. 
So what are the characteristics you might say of good governance? We want to design a better governance system. We clearly need something that can deal with complexity, not uniformity, unity and diversity. We can't do the same thing everywhere. It has to be based on cooperation and reciprocity, as we see often stated in the Baha'i writings. It means distributed control with subsidiarity, not totally centralized management, where each entity has its place with many specializations, but integrated together. Any exclusion of partisanism is a loss of potential, so it needs to be very inclusive. It also has to be self-correcting homeostatic because we're dealing with a very complex system moving rapidly over time, which means we need more learning, innovation, and evolving to adapt to changes, not one fixed system that will go on forever. And we know in system science that you have emerging properties at higher levels of complexity. The more we can organize this global complexity, the more our civilization can evolve, bringing the well-being of the whole that is more and the sum of the parts. So global governance today? So I mentioned our world is increasingly globalized and interconnected, but there is no effective mechanism for governance, law, and collaboration at the scale of these global challenges and catastrophic risks, whether economic, social, or environmental. Global governance is still voluntary and requires consensus. The climate change is in your all governments have to agree to a decision. Anyone can block you know, whatever everybody else sees is needed. So how can we address this vacuum in global governance? We published a book a few years ago with two Baha'i colleagues on global governance, the emergency of global decisions for the 21st century, where we actually lay out in 150 pages the, what we have to do to fix the United Nations system to actually adapt it to the needs of the 21st century. And we've now created a global governance forum that is taking these ideas forward. And just yesterday at the meetings going on in New York, they organized three side events on the dimensions of that, you know, what we need to do to fix the UN Charter and address these, these global challenges. And the approach recommended is that we need governance with legislative executive judicial functions. Nations only give up the right to make war in exchange for effective mechanisms of collective security and peaceful settlement of disputes. And so we need to gradually develop relevant institutions and processes, building confidence in their effectiveness in reducing national insecurity with carefully coordinated disarmament. And of course, trust that justice will be done. States have to become trustworthy. It was not the case today where they sign up to lots of agreements and then don't respect them. And we need a collective sense of moral responsibility. So the ethical moral dimension is an important part of building a better system of governments at any level. So in terms of global environmental governments, Already in 1972, we had the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment and the Creation of the Environment That's the picture I took when I was there representing the Baha'i International Community. We have over to multilateral environmental agreements on climate, biodiversity, pollution, and many other things. We had the 1992 Rio Earth Summit adopting Agenda 21. This is a whole plan for sustainable development. 20 years later, there was a UN Conference on Sustainable Development, which adopted, led to the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Last year, we had the Stockholm Plus 50 international meeting. And uh, next year, we will have a summit of the future in September, which hopefully will take this whole debate on global numbers forward. It's certainly on the agenda. Secretary has called for re reform in the UN system. This is an opportunity to begin to make changes. And this last year, we've seen the creation of a Climate Governance Commission, which in fact is coordinated by a Baha'i. And it is headed by a uh, you know, the three co-chairs, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, head of the elders, and Mar Maria Fernandez uh, and uh, Johan Rockstone, the leading climate scientist. So two of the three organizers you know, are female and the organizers. Are, you know, so there's, a, there's a, a reasonable gender balance, you know, in these structures where Baha'is are involved in their creation. And is having a presentation tomorrow, it's just launched a wonderful statement on where we need to go on climate governance uh, launched two days ago. Another thing, the commission asked myself, another Baha'i, to prepare proposals for a global environment agency, uh, which is, is, is now you know, available. Uh, and uh, it sa says that faced with the existential environmental threats of climate change, biodiversity, loss, pollution, land, ocean degradation, we have to address all of them together. For together, we have several different you know, individual conventions for different parts of that. So we need to inter interconnect global environmentalists to protect 
the global common good of all, which means we have to need a polycentric governance system based on the principle of subsidiarity, with the environment agents as a global institution that would have binding authority over the essential areas of, of planetary commons, but leaving many other things to governance at other levels. It would have five governance functions, a knowledge provision function, providing scientific advice, a deliberate legislative function, adopting binding legislation for the common good with equitable sharing responsibilities, including everyone. It needs a, let's say, an executive function enabling implementing, orchestrating the global system of environmental management in a coherent global strategy with diversity in regional, national, and local approaches. It needs a trust and justice building function for accountability, mediation, and dispute settlement. And then a learning reflectivity function so to learn from experience, adapt to complexity and uncertainty to the world that's changing rapidly as we go forward. So this would mean a digital evolution of UNEP into a global environment agency with a polycentric system of authority to set global rules and norms with values for collective security. The UN Environment Assembly could become you know, a, a new legislative body to adopt binding legislation on planetary boundaries not just for governments, but also non-stake actors like multinational corporations and even wealthy, wealthy individuals. We need an independent global scientific advisory council with scientists from all the relevant disciplines, natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, to provide an objective basis for action. So science-based you know, governance. The UN High-Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism in its report released in May, a breakthrough people and planet which I've members have made inputs, includes a whole proposal on global environment governance based on the paper I just cited and giving the Environment Forum as the way, place to go to see the report of that paper. So we've, our ideas have reached the global level and are being seriously considered in the international debate at the moment. This was also presented yesterday you know, in the discussions you know, in the EU on global governance. Quoting again from that high level advisory board, they say that central importance of the environment to all aspects of the lives and collective well-being must be accompanied by an elevation of the environment within the global governance system. This requires strengthening UNEP and the UN Environment Assembly with mandates and resources comparable to UN's development, peace and security, and human rights institutions. They often talk about the three pillars of the UN, your development, peace and security, human rights. Now they're calling for a fourth pillar, which would be environment and climate change. Specifically, UNEP should be empowered to adopt more effective global environment agency, able to track our interrelated impacts on the on the environment, consolidate you know, our commitments, condition our global financial investments, drive transformative incentive for people and the planet across you know, a broader multilateralism. So this is quoting from you know this the high-level UN report, which cites our the document as its source. The climate guards group just issued on two days ago, on Monday, a statement for the meetings in UN this week that we're commemorating with the Environment Forum you know, Conference in his, uh, preparing his final report for COP28 later this year. Uh, we've been contributing to the work of the commission and this we may be an opportunity for a breakthrough towards global binding legislation because the science is so clear and the need is so urgent. If you're interested to know more, uh, these are the sources of the Environment Forum itself. It has lots of resources on this, the Global Governance Forum, another place you can turn for information. Climate Governance Commission you know, has a website where its resources are available, and we're working on global solidarity accounting to try to provide better measures of how we can make progress forward. So I'll stop showing now. That's basically my effort to summarize briefly what we're trying to do to fix the global environmental system you know, at, the, at the planetary level and look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, and thanks again to all the panelists for a very, uh, uh, very powerful uh, and illuminating uh, presentations this morning. Um, and you have certainly uh, triggered some questions, uh, and we'll get into those questions right away without losing any time. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Monica if she would um, read the first question, please. Sure. Um, so the first question is, since land ownership is primarily held by men, less than 30% is owned by women, how can they effectively promote change in this sphere? 
And this question is addressed to Tahira, please. Thank you, Tahira. Thank you um, for the question. Um, being um, someone living in, in a country like South Africa, um, and um, you know, having lived through apartheid and 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 laws that oppressed um, black people and people of color, and uh, in that spectrum, you know, black woman one would would say would be the most oppressed. So, how do we begin to change things that don't work? towards the well-being. And in this instance, we're talking about land. So this would have been the similar question for a black woman 30 years ago. It would have been the same question. We, we were not the owners of anything in society. And so um, my best response to that question is, you need a societal process. In South Africa, we had to go through a societal journey, or the journey of change, changing a set of laws that didn't work for the overwhelming majority of its citizens. You know, we had the minority white ruling the majority black. And how do I get to be an owner of property? I own property now. How does, how does that happen? How did that happen? I can own it because laws in my country make that possible. There's a constitution that protects me. It says I'm an equal person in my country and it tells me what my rights are. And so if we want to deal with the land issue, um, this is really an equality project worldwide. Um, it, it does mean we need to examine, you know, what are those structures in society that can facilitate and promote and advance and bring about equality. And in this instance, the equality for women to be land owners. I doubt that we can, uh, we can do this without going through that journey. It's a, it's a journey of, of change. It's a journey of the relationships between men and women, um, better relationships between men and women. And I do believe it, this is a global project. Um, in South Africa, we had a very specific kind of oppression, which was racial. But even within that racial oppression, we had women not having access to land and many other uh, things that we see. So I think laws need to change. Um, and, we, and we need to work with processes. Um, it will require a level of patience, I imagine. Um, it will require a level of creativity to, to help societies to see that we work against our collective advancement if we don't bring about this change. That no society can be fully functional if we have laws that, for in this instance, for example, don't even allow women to, to own the land and um, regard women as, as equal citizens. Um, Yes, so I'm I'm very grateful to anybody else's input, um, but I'm I'm speaking from a South African perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Tahira. Um, so yeah, it's really very important to to establish this connection um, to laws and processes. So thank you very much for your contribution to this question. Um, the next question is actually addressed to Arthur Dow. Uh, when we talk about a body for global environmental governance, how can we ensure that this body would be truly effective and free from much of the bureaucracy and attachment to national agendas that we see often in the UN? And this question was raised by Nava, Nava Kuram. Well, I think. This, you know, there are a number of different elements of how we would address this kind of question. Um, some of it we've addressed in our book on global governance, where we actually have chapters on the need for a larger ethical framework, on the kind of training you would give to international civil servants so they work for the common good and not for special interests. Uh, so part of it is you know, acknowledging where there are weaknesses and taking the kind of reasonable steps you would take in designing the structures to 
you try to correct for them as far as possible. Also, when I referred to you know the global environmental government agency as having as an orchestrating function, this means it wouldn't be designed to do everything, to control everything. It would be more like an orchestra conductor where different instruments in the orchestra play different parts. It says, this is the piece we're going to play. This is a piece of music. And then each one plays their part. By distributing responsibility that way, you also you know, increase the effectiveness and reduce the, the dangers of a giant bureaucracy getting frozen, you know, holding on to its power or things of this sort. So there, there are ways you can think of the way of its structure to avoid you know, some of these traps. Uh, and of course, with respect to, to national agendas, I think we have the advantage in the environmental area that the, the, the steps needed to protect the global commons are so, everybody is, is vulnerable. Everybody is, is going to suffer from them. And therefore, uh, national agendas are much less relevant if you're protecting them from climate change because you know, we have to, everybody sees we have to do it together and that the free riders will be hurting everybody else and therefore, there will be mutual pressure on those that are not carrying out, you know, what they've they've they've, they've agreed to do or what needs to be done. Uh, one one then can also say, you know, what other kind of enforcement mechanisms? I think a lot can be done to create positive incentives. You know, the the, the, the enforcement of the punishing or fining or whatever is always much more expensive, much more complicated than providing positive incentives. And I think by designing the governance systems well, so that there are incentives to do the right thing, that becomes much more effective kind of enforcement than having to try to force the recalcitrant to, to change their behavior. That's part of the answers anyway. Thank you. Monica, what's our next question? Thank you, Arthur. Uh, so the next question, uh, there were a series of questions that um, Joachim had uh, added in his slide, and I think that they are relevant if we have a little bit of some time to go through them. So uh, the first question is, what types of trade inventions are needed to move from one side of the diagram of his presentation that he, he put the, the, the two sides of the diagram? And if you can just uh, remind us, which sides of the diagram that you referred about, Joachim, uh, to the other side. And if we can maybe have that question uh, addressed to Arthur Dahl. But at first, please, Joachim, clarify uh, what are the two sides of the diagram that you refer about. Well, I think there are a number, you know, this parsing means how do we redesign you know, the trade system as part of a positive, constructive, sharing of of different capacities around the world you know different countries have different resources different climates you know different seasons with the north and southern hemisphere uh, and therefore there's a need for some sharing in, in global trade to better make use of all the capacities around the planet but if it's done in the spirit of everybody's well-being and benefit as opposed to being driven by the desire for profit by the most powerful corporations which often distorts that system. So you know, today, where is there the, the cheapest labor? Where is there no environmental regulations that can reduce their costs and make more profits? Uh, you know, the trade system has been corrupted in many ways by these other selfish interests. And therefore, you need to be designing a system in which everybody recognizes the benefits they can get from cooperating as opposed to you know, the so-called benefits you know, from competition or you know, from you know, from uh, you know, going in in the wrong direction. So I think this is this is where you, you, it's part of putting better values into the foundation of the system, and helping everybody to see that by cooperation they will all benefit. They all can contribute in some way and receive corresponding benefits from the, the other things other parts of the system can contribute, whether it be governments themselves or whether it be you know the in economic actors. Thank you. I have a question for Wahim. Uh, in, you mentioned the carbon border adjustment measure uh, that the EU has put in place. Um, is this a is it reasonable to conclude that this is a hopeful sign of a developing sense of social responsibility? 
um, in the EU countries um, that the importers uh, of goods and products into the EU have a responsibility for the emissions that are generated in their production elsewhere. Is, is this a hopeful sign? Is this indicating some kind of a maturation at the, in, in governance? Um, yes, I think, first of all, um, I think it's very courageous of the EU actually to, uh, to rock the boat, let's say. Um, but this can also bring uh, challenges with it for, uh, Arthur mentioned, the, the, the biggest companies that they, are, they will be able to deal with uh, regulations like CBAM. But for smaller corporations, for smaller countries, it will be more difficult because they have to deliver a lot of data. Uh, they need to know the processes of uh, how to uh, in export to the EU in the future. They need to have the contact. So uh, the stronger might get stronger out of this because they can deal with the regulations. Whereas for smaller companies, smaller countries, it might be more challenging. So on the one hand, yeah, it's, it's a maturation of, of, of the EU process. And, and uh, it shows how serious the EU is to take the risk of, let's say, have a... Um, trade conflicts with other countries because other countries, they could complain about CBAM at the WTO, for example, and they could say this is discriminatory. Uh, the EU is blocking its market access and um, they could ask the WTO to, to do something about that. But we see more what we have seen is, is uh, let's say, hesitant engagement with the EU. So um, actually, these EU policies, which are becoming more and more strict, are also, let's say, forcing or motivating uh, third countries to uh, ramp up their own climate policies. Because if you have your own uh, carbon pricing into place or equivalent climate measures, then you don't have to pay that uh, carbon tax for exporting to the EU. So uh, we see in India, for example, that in India, this was one of the big motivations um, for India to um, design its own um, carbon pricing mechanism. And India is really uh, speeding up that process. So uh, when you talk to some gov governments in the EU, they also say actually CBAM is, um, is a, it's a, a mechanism for collaboration between countries. So it's really all about how you look at it. And the climate change is often this elephant and you have 10 men or women touching different parts of the elephant. And one thing uh, touches the leg and it's a, they think it's a trunk of a tree and somebody touches the, uh, the, 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 the skin of the elephant and thinks it's, um, it's a car or, you know, uh, everybody is touching different parts of this huge elephant that climate change is and, and we all have different perspectives on it and that's also usually when i teach I, I i say this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to uh agree upon climate change because if you're in canada you have very different climate problems than if you're a small island uh, developing nation that uh, that is flooding soon so um Countries like Canada and Russia will even benefit from climate change, for example, largely. So uh, there's different perspectives. And, and one of the big challenges that we need to solve um, to uh, unite those different perspectives is through deliberative uh, processes. And this term is coming up more and more, but this, I think, is really important to address uh, global environmental challenges uh, through better processes of uh, deliberation. Maybe more. That's maybe that's more important than processes of, of governance per se. And as Baha'is, we know of the process of consultation, right? So we have the techniques. We, we, we are quite ahead, I think, in this space, yeah. Thank you. Monica, do we have a, another question? Yes, I would like to uh, raise a question to, to Joachim. And, and I think that it is also related to a question that you raised in your slide previously and it it just um it just connects very well to your last point about Baha'i values but um if you can please elaborate on some of the Baha'i values in the current geopolitical time frame uh if I could do that myself um well, first of all, you can see uh, at the working level that people are very discouraged, people who are working on international uh, collaboration. So whether you talk to diplomats, to people in secretariats of the UN and other international organizations, there's very little hope for the future. People have no vision, I think, of uh, what the future would look like. 
Uh, they've seen uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, in the 1990s, uh, collaboration really went up. There was a lot of optimism, but after the year 2000, I would say, it has slowly gone down the hill. And um, these are not responsibilities of any individual person, any individual president or country. These are just bigger swings in, uh, in history, right, that we see. And it's very difficult uh, as individuals to, uh, to stop that or to, to uh, move that uh, momentum around. So uh, I think understanding of the bigger picture is necessary. Uh, Arthur also mentioned uh, systems thinking. Uh, let's say take a step back and <laughs> look at uh, where we are coming from as humanity, uh, where we've been. That there's been phases of better international collaboration, I think. There's been much worse phases. Uh, and as Baha'is, I think we have this vision of the future uh, and we have this hope. And um, we know that this is a temporary challenge that we are facing in the world. It's a temporary situation that will pass. Um, and uh, But the situation indeed is very uh, hopeless for a lot of people. So in the end, governance, we often say governance as if it's some process that's taking place in a computer or a machine, but this is people's work. Uh, Every day, diplomats are working on international collaboration. And if those people are not literally inspired, because often they're not inspired, that's, uh, that's a very big challenge. So I think one um, important step is to uh, set the right example to be inspired ourselves, uh, not to give up hope, to be courageous, to speak out. And um, yeah, that, 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 that's uh, small steps uh, that we can take uh, every day, I think, to be the change uh, that we want to see in the world and to be patient. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Monica, I believe we have a question for Tahira. Yes, um, there are actually two questions for Tahira. So one question is, what factors of principles of obedience to government are preventing women to be effectively involved in peace movements? And the second question I'm also going to put for you, uh, Tahira, just in case you would like to also answer with the first are the four waves of feminism a useful construct for cooperative progress toward equity and equality? Oh, those are big questions. Um, I think it's very important in any challenge, any challenge. Today, we are in this seminar, we are talking about climate change. Um, but there are several other challenges in the world. And I would say we are on a very slippery slope. If we try to attempt a solution to any challenge from a basis of fragmentation or disunity. So the principle of obedience to, 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 to government is really framed within a setting of an ordered way an, an ordered way to confront a challenge. If we if we tackle any problem from a position that from its inception is based on division, the likelihood of it succeeding is a zero to no and less. So um, in the South African example, um, when we when we look at the era of uh, legislated apartheid, this was often a question given to Baha'is in various forums because we were not in any way promoting disobedience to the government or anything that goes against the government. Um, I think it's um, it's very useful to use the tools of consultation. It's very useful to work in the framework of constantly, and which we did in South Africa as the Baha'i community, constantly talking to our government, never um, giving any reason for any government official to think that the Baha'is oppose the government. So it's a very, um, it's a very tricky piece of work um, because we want to see outcomes that benefit the entire society. At the same time, a governmental structure might be set up in such a way that that realization 
um, doesn't look possible in a given um, period. Uh, nonetheless, we have to persevere in the utilization of consultation and dialogue and 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 helping um, everyone facing a particular dilemma to see the benefit of having a structure that benefits all. And sometimes uh, we have to work with our governments in that way. I mean, at the moment in our country, we have energy policies. I mean, if this conference, for example, was yesterday, I don't know if I would be able to present because I didn't have power in my in my home. Um, you know, we've we've and so um and the energy ministry is part of the government in in in, in our country. And so um constantly as citizens. We are trying to reach out to that sector of society to see are there better ways that we can do some of what's being done. Um, so uh, a, a divided platform isn't good. Um, um, finding the enabling spaces to bring more understanding to a situation, I think is always the better option to follow. And I can see um, in the environmental forum that I serve, um, it works best, better for us when we send representatives from our forum to speak with people um, in the ministry and try and convince uh, them of better ways of, of, of running certain segments um, of the government. So, yeah, I think one has to be very cautious. We also see... Um, that the the laws do help us uh, to to bring about a shift in the understanding of the status of woman that the woman is an equal uh, citizen uh, uh, in the country and so when any form of inequality emerges that scenario creates a space to dialogue and to further the consultation so that we can actually reach the agreements that are um, that are beautifully written in our constitution. So um, whenever there is a wrongdoing, um, we must exert the effort and put the necessary um, structures in place so that we can do the hard work to correct whatever is not working or correct whatever oppresses any um, any citizen, in this case, woman. Here's a question for Arthur. Uh, the proposal for global environmental governance requires some significant changes in mindsets, which are definitely needed. However, I can see how the transition will take place if people within the organizations are not transformed, the person asks. How can we encourage or guide people on a path of personal transformation is the question. As I mentioned, we addressed this to some extent in our book on global governance, where we talked about the, the need to educate people who, who you know, are being recruited in the civ international civil service to the values you know, of you know, service to humanity. To, and in fact, I was very fortunate in my own work in the UN, my, my immediate boss believed in the UN values, if you take any credit for the work he was doing, he said, we're here to serve governments, to you know, help governments do things better. And so there are wonderfully motivated people within the system. There, of course, are also people who come in full of ego and desire and so on, as there are in any, any society today. And it's only as Baha'i values become more widespread that they might say the pool of desirable kinds of people will expand. But already we can see more and more there are Baha'is who are rising to quite high levels within the international system and therefore able to bring those values in. You know, people may not know it, but the, the person who organized most of the negotiations behind the Paris Climate Agreement was a Baha'i in the Secretariat who was in charge of putting get that together. You know, uh, Hanzo Thorgerson of Iceland, who's actually a board member of the National Environment Forum. So, you know, there, there are, some of us are trying to, you know, as we can, bring those values into the system. And as, as the world, you know, recognizes the importance of these values, and see how productive they are when they're applied, 
that will help us to, will help us to, to take things further and further in the right direction. But clearly, we have to transform the whole of society, not just for the environment, but everything else we need to do on the planet requires you know, that kind of, of transformation in values today. That also responds to the concern that was raised earlier about, about wars, because as long as you have people who are ready to go to war and cause any kind of environmental damage for their own selfish ego you know, or their own national pride, we have you know, forces of destruction that we you know, have are difficult to control until we can make those more fundamental spiritual changes. Thank you. Thank you. We've got uh, just a few minutes left, and um, I have a question that I'd like to put to all three panelists, um, and uh, it's it's regarding social action. Is there is there a vision of employing the principles of social action to build networks of support in the push for a global regulatory agency for the environment? Um, and I'm I'm thinking, you know, in, in in conjunction with that question, I'm thinking about uh, the vulnerability factor that uh, Tahira uh, mentioned. Um, that uh, whether women's organizations, for example, would be um, places, uh, spaces where uh, public discourses could be encouraged. Um, by individual Baha'is across the planet and others uh, who are like-minded uh, to, to, to advance uh, these ideas and the discourse on uh, global environmental governance because of the effect uh, that it has uh, disproportionately on women. Is that, is that uh, not clear? Would you like to go first? Tahira, do you want to go first? I think it will go a long way uh, to involve um, women um, in this discourse. Um, um, it's never good to forge ahead, you know, with any any matter that concerns all of us on the planet. So um, I'm sure I'm sure there are women in the world who who would want to be a part of the change, not only at the international level, but also for that change to filter down um, to, the, to, to the local, because that's also where we need to see the change. So it would be good, it would be good in this discourse to reach out to, to, to women um, organizations and structures and, to, and to, to get their input into, you know, how do we how do we make a better impact in the system? How do we get out of it what we actually want to see change in the world? How do we ensure that by whatever name we call these structures, that from the inception, from the very inception, that we have women present? And 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 so I do think that is an important um, consideration that. Um, we bring women into it from the very beginning. Um, I'm sure the women across the world take this as a serious uh, aspect of their lives. And uh, um, there's, I think there's a lot of value in that question and a lot of value in that consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on the uh, role of social action in this in this process of advancing uh, the concept of global environmental governance? Well, uh, this, of course, is one of the main purposes of our International Environment Forum, to be involved in public discourse and to push these these ideas forward. And uh, and it's also we've been asked by the Baha'i National Development Agency to help them to to conceive all the different environmental dimensions of social action, even at the local level. Uh, we know that taking part in these things is, is part of the, the Baha'i's plans as they go forward uh, in, in public discourse and social action are, are key elements. And therefore the more and more Baha'i communities see the importance of these issues and apply them first in terms of their local reality, but also recognize that you know things that they cannot directly control like 
and climate change also have to be handled through global environmental governance and therefore become voices to also call for action at that level. So we have movement across all the different levels from local to national to international. I think this is, you know, there's a coherence to hear, you know, as awareness grows and as, you know, people recognize that this is part of our responsibility at all levels, whether it be men and women, and we're already partnering with many other, you know, organizations uh, at different levels. And so, so certainly in local Baha'i communities, they often find that the most receptive ear is other environmental organizations in their local community, because they have great community gardens and so on and so forth. At the national level, you know, the national communities collaborate with many other organizations that share similar values with ours. So this is already happening to some extent. And as people become more aware of how important the environmental issues are to all the other values that we support, that will help the momentum at all levels, as the Baha'i communities grow all around the world, you know, in rural and urban areas, you know, in the developed and developing countries, you know, wherever, all of that will help to build momentum to the changes that were needed. And at the same time, where you have the example of successful Baha'i environmental projects at the local and international level, that also are example you can show that this is not just words, we're already acting on our values, we're making a difference in improving the environments in our communities and therefore it gives us the credibility to take this message up higher and higher in, in the chain of decision making. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, Arthur, and thank you um, uh, to all panelists. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to, um, uh, first of all, thank, uh, thank you, the panelists, uh, for preparing uh, these informative uh, presentations for us today. I'd also like to thank uh, the conference co-sponsors, the Wilmette Institute, the Baha'i International Community, and uh, EBBF, Ethical Business Building the Future, for their support for this conference. And of course, uh, it wouldn't uh, there wouldn't be a conference without all of our attendees and their questions and comments. And, and we're very grateful for those contributions from you. I'm sorry we couldn't get to answer all of your questions, but um, hopefully uh, there'll be, uh, uh, IEF will provide uh, some other spaces in which there can be further consultation and discussion of, of these principles and, 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 um, and this topic. So um, with that, uh, we're gonna close now. And, uh, but just before closing, I would just like to announce that tomorrow's panel will be uh, titled uh, Global Solidarity Accounting, Values for Wellbeing. And I hope uh, some of you, if not all of you, can find time to uh, join us for that meeting. Thank you. And thank you to our moderator for moderating so well. Thank you, everyone.